Wisdom of Solomon About this book Although this book is written as though Solomon was the author, it was probably written in the first century BC in Alexandria, Egypt, to encourage the Jews living there to be faithful to God. Some had abandoned the Jewish faith and adopted Greek religions, and the author wanted to show the Jews that the teachings and wisdom found in the scriptures were better than those of Greek religion and philosophy. To do this, the author also had to deal with the old problem of why evil people are often successful, while good people are suffering. The author states that God will bring about justice when he judges all people after death. The wicked will be punished, but those who were faithful to God will live with him forever. Trust the Lord Chapter 1 you rulers of this earth should love justice. You should do what is right and keep the Lord in mind. The Lord will answer your prayers if you trust and don't doubt. Our deceitful thoughts separate us from God, and by putting God to the test we make fools of ourselves, because wisdom won't live with deceitful slaves of sin. A pure mind and self-control won't let you be deceitful. You will reject foolish thoughts and hate injustice. Our words and thoughts are known to God. Although wisdom is friendly, she will still hold you guilty if you speak evil of God. Even words spoken in secret and our most private thoughts are known to God, because the Spirit of the Lord is everywhere in this world. His Spirit holds it all together and hears every word. And so liars will be judged and then punished. Their evil plans and deeds will be discovered, then reported to the Lord, and they will be sentenced. Nothing can escape being heard, not even a faint grumble. So stop all useless complaining and fault-finding. Even a faint whisper can cause a problem, and lies are deadly. God created us to live. Don't invite death and destruction by living like a fool. God did not create us for death, and when we die it doesn't make him glad. God created all creatures with life that continues. All living beings should keep on living untouched by deadly poison, because the kingdom of death doesn't rule this world, and justice lives forever. Evil Thoughts of Evil People The words and deeds of evil people are an invitation to death. They think of death as friendly and desirable. They are partners with death, just as they deserve. Chapter 2 Their foolish minds lead them to say to each other, Life is short and sad. The end is certain to come and no one escapes the grave. Only by chance were we born, and after we are gone, everything will be as though we had never been. Our breath is merely smoke, and reason is a spark from the beat of our hearts. When that beating ends, our bodies turn to dust, and our spirits vanish into thin air. In time, we will be forgotten, and so will our deeds. Life disappears like a cloud. It melts away like mist in the heat of the sun. Time fades away like a shadow, and no one returns from death. So make the most of life, especially while you're young. Drink the very best wine, wear expensive perfume, and enjoy the spring flowers. Decorate your head with rosebuds before they wilt. Do your share of celebrating, Party always and everywhere, that's what life is all about. Abuse the poor and the honest, and do the same to widows and old people. After all, might is right, and weakness is useless. Destroy law-abiding people, get them out of the way. 
All they do is condemn you for breaking the law and doing what we know is wrong. They claim to know the Lord God and to be his children. That's why they criticize your very thoughts. Just looking at good people is a heavy burden. Their lifestyle is so different. In fact, it's strange. They think you're trash and they won't have anything to do with you. They claim God is their father and that he will reward them. So test what they say by watching them die. If those so-called good people really are God's children, he will look after them. We will insult and torture them to find out how gentle and patient they are. We will sentence them to a shameful death. After all, they have said that they will be protected. Evil people are foolish. That's the reasoning of those who are evil, and they are both blind and foolish. They don't understand what God has in mind, and they don't know the reward for living right. God created us to live forever, just as he himself does. But death entered the world because the devil was jealous, and so all his followers die. The Future of Those Who Please God Chapter 3 The souls of those who have pleased God are safe in His hands and protected from pain. Only in the minds of the foolish are those people dead and their death considered a disaster or a destruction. In fact, they are at peace and destined never to die, though others may have thought they were being punished. They will be richly rewarded because God tested them for a while and found them worthy of being his children. God tested them like gold in a fiery furnace, and he accepted them like a pleasing sacrifice. When God shows them mercy, they will be like shining sparks setting weeds on fire. The Lord will rule them forever and let them rule over nations. All of God's faithful people will understand truth and live with him in love because God is kind and merciful to those he chooses to be his holy people. Punishment for the wicked. The wicked will be punished as their evil thoughts deserve. They rebelled against the Lord and abused his people. They are terribly miserable because they reject wisdom and sound advice. Their future is hopeless, and everything they do is completely useless. Their wives are foolish, their children are evil, and under God's curse. God blesses the needy. A wife who remains faithful will be given children at a time that God decides. Men who remain faithful to God and do good deeds will receive special blessings and be given honored positions in the temple of the Lord, even though they may be unable to have children. Remember that good deeds are easily recognized. They are like fruit on a vine that has wisdom as its roots. But children born to persons who have committed some terrible sexual sin will die before they grow up. Even if they live a long time, they won't be respected. And if they die in their youth, they will be without hope on the day of judgment, because misery is the reward for doing evil. Chapter 4 Living right is better than having children. Both God and people will always remember you and the good you have done. People imitate goodness, and they miss it when it is gone. Goodness always triumphs. It receives the highest honors because it is unselfish. But all of the many children born to sinners will be useless and helpless like trees without roots. They may blossom for a while, but they will be swept away in a gust of wind. Their branches will be broken before they mature, and the fruit they produce will be worthless. When God judges the world, 
these children will be witnesses against their sinful parents. Good people may die early, but they will be at rest. True respect isn't gained merely by growing old. People are honored because of their wisdom and goodness. Enoch, a person God loved and who pleased him, was living among sinners, but God took him away to protect his mind and soul from the influence of evil. Even the most innocent person can be deceived and destroyed by sinful thoughts. But Enoch loved the Lord. He became mature in a few years and pleased the Lord, so he quickly took Enoch away to protect him from evil. Others failed to understand that this is how God shows kindness and mercy and protects his holy people. Good people will triumph. Good people may die young, but they shame those sinners who live a long time. Sinners fail to understand why God gives them a long life and lets the wise die young. When they see this happen, they simply sneer. But God will laugh at them because their dead bodies will be forever disgusting to the rest of the dead. God will throw them speechless to the ground, and they will be like buildings that crumble. They will suffer and rot, then be forgotten. The Final Judgment Sinners will be horrified when they are condemned by their evil deeds. Chapter 5 But all who have pleased God will stand with confidence in the presence of those who abused them and made fun of the good they did. When those evil ones see how God has saved his people, they will tremble with fear and be completely amazed. They will groan and say to each other, We should have turned from sin. We were fools to sneer at those people, but we thought they were fools who had died in disgrace. Why are they God's children? Why are they his holy people? So we were the ones who turned from truth and rejected the light from those good people. We refused to follow the Lord. Instead, we were lawless and followed a desert road that led us to destruction. All of our pride and wealth has proved to be useless. Everything that we treasured has vanished like a shadow or a hastily spoken word, or like the wake of a ship on ocean waves or like the flight of a bird through the air, or like the unknown path of an arrow on its way to the target. As soon as we were born, we began to disappear, because we followed only evil and left behind no traces of anything good. Sinners have no more hope than dust in the wind, or frost in the heat of the sun, or smoke in a breeze. They are remembered no longer than an overnight guest. The Lord's people will be rewarded. The Lord Most High takes care of his people. He will reward them, and they will live forever. The Lord will protect them with his powerful right arm, and he will bless them with a glorious crown. Eagerness will be like armor for the Lord, and he will equip all creation to fight and punish his enemies. The Lord will protect his chest with deeds of fairness, and for a helmet he will wear equal justice for all. Holiness will be his strong shield, and fierce anger will be his sharp sword. All creation will join with him in fighting his crazy enemies. Arrows of lightning will leap from behind the clouds and never miss their target. Fearsome hailstones will strike the Lord's enemies, while ocean waves and rivers roll over them like a flood. Then a mighty windstorm will sweep them away, because lawlessness and evil bring ruin to the whole earth and to every kingdom. Rulers should desire wisdom. Chapter 6 Now listen and learn, you kings and judges. Listen, all of you rulers who control many nations. 
you received your authority from the Lord Most High, and he will judge your deeds and your thoughts. Although you were his servants, you disobeyed him and ruled unjustly. So now the Lord will punish you both quickly and harshly because you are in power. God forgives ordinary people, but severely punishes the high and the mighty. The Lord created everyone, the powerful and the weak. God has no favorites, he isn't afraid of anyone, and he requires rulers to answer for what they do. I am speaking to you rulers so that you will have wisdom and not sin against God. If you want to belong to the Lord's holy people and to defend yourself on the day of judgment, then eagerly desire to learn all that I am teaching. What wisdom is like? Wisdom shines brightly and never fades. She is easily recognized by those who love her and look for her. Wisdom wants to be known by those who desire her. If you get up early to look for wisdom, you find her at your door. Just thinking about wisdom leads to full understanding. And caring about wisdom will soon set you free from all other cares. Wisdom searches eagerly for those who are seeking, and she lets them find her in all of their thoughts. If you really want wisdom, then fall in love with her and desire to learn. If you truly love wisdom, you will obey her laws. Then you will be sure of life after death. And just as life after death will bring you near to God, the desire for wisdom will protect your kingdom. So if you want to rule for a long time, you must respect wisdom. I will now tell you clearly the full truth about her from the very beginning. I won't be jealous or conceal anything I know. That isn't the way of wisdom. The only hope for the world is for many of us to be wise. Indeed, a wise ruler gives security to a nation. So be guided by my teachings, and you will be successful. Solomon speaks about death. Chapter 7 Like everyone else, I am destined to die. I, too, am a descendant of that man who was made from the soil of the earth, and my body took shape inside my mother's womb. For ten months I was there, growing in her blood from seed left by my father, as they were making love. And when I was born, I breathed the same air as others and touched the same earth. Like all other children, my first sound was a cry. I was nursed with love and dressed in baby clothes. No rulers have their beginning any differently. All enter life in the same way and leave in the same way. Solomon praises wisdom. I asked God for wisdom and for understanding, and my prayer was answered. Nothing compares with wisdom, and so I chose her over power and wealth. In comparison with wisdom, precious gems are nothing. Gold is merely sand, and silver is simply clay. I preferred wisdom more than a healthy and handsome body. The brightest light grows dim when compared with her. Wisdom brought me wealth and everything good. I was pleased with all that she brought me, though I failed to realize that wisdom was the source. I sincerely studied, then freely shared the riches I learned from wisdom. Wisdom's treasures never end. God approves of her, and those who gain wisdom are friends of God. Solomon prays for wisdom. I pray that God will help me to say the right thing and to have thoughts worthy of his gifts to me. God shows wisdom the way and instructs wise people. Our lives and our words, our understanding and skills are all in the hands of God. 
from God came my knowledge about the universe and how its parts work, about the way a calendar is determined, about the movement of the sun and the changing seasons, about the way the years come and go on schedule, about the groups of stars and the way animals behave, both tame and wild, about the motion of the wind and the thoughts of humans, about all kinds of plants and the value of roots. I learned hidden mysteries and things known to all because I was taught by wisdom who made everything. Wisdom is both intelligent and holy. Though one of a kind, she appears in many forms and is a spiritual being that moves freely about. Wisdom is clear and pure, spotless and innocent, and she loves goodness. Wisdom is sharp and victorious, generous, helpful, dependable, and she never worries. Wisdom is all-powerful, she sees everything and is ever-present with those who are intelligent pure and truly spiritual. Wisdom moves more easily than anything else and is so pure that she is everywhere at once. Wisdom is the breath of God's power, the true reflection of the glory of God, all-powerful. And so she cannot be touched by anything impure. Wisdom is like a mirror reflecting the eternal light of God's deeds and goodness. Though wisdom is and remains only one being, she can do anything, and she renews all things. In each generation she enters the souls of the faithful, making them into prophets and friends of God, since God's favorite people are those who live with her. Wisdom is more beautiful than the sun and the stars, she is far superior to daylight because it turns to darkness, but she cannot be changed by the power of evil. Chapter 8 Wisdom rules the universe and keeps it in order. Solomon's Love for Wisdom Since the time I was young, I have loved and searched for wisdom. I was charmed by her beauty and wanted her for my bride. The Lord God of all loves her, and her glorious origin becomes even more glorious because she lives with God. She understands God's mysteries and works together with Him. Wisdom is more desirable than wealth. She makes everything run smoothly. Wisdom is more useful than knowledge. She designed everything that is. If you truly love what is right, learn from her the source of all goodness, of justice and courage, understanding and self-control, all the important things that help us live our lives. Do you desire wide experience? Wisdom knows what has happened and predicts the future. She knows the meaning of words and the answers to riddles. Wisdom knows in advance the miracles God will work and all that will take place. Rulers need wisdom. So I decided to bring wisdom home to live with me. She will offer good advice as well as comfort in times of suffering and grief. She will bring me great honor from advisers and many others, even though I am young. I will have sound judgment and be admired by rulers. They will wait for my opinion, then listen when I speak, and they will be amazed at my marvelous speeches. Because of wisdom, my name will live on forever. I will rule many nations and be a hero in battle. Oppressive rulers will tremble at the mention of my name, with wisdom as my friend, I will live happily and at peace, with no bitter regrets. I thought deeply about wisdom and all that she offered, unending life and perfect joy because of her friendship, wealth and understanding because of her companionship, and fame because of her words. So I searched for wisdom. 
I was an intelligent child, born with a good soul. Rather, since my soul was good, it entered a perfect body. I had the insight to realize wisdom is the gift of God, and so with all my heart I prayed for wisdom. Solomon's Prayer for Wisdom Chapter 9 Merciful Lord God of my ancestors, you created everything by your word, and by your wisdom you let us humans rule all other creatures. We are to be honest and fair in every decision, so share with me the wisdom that sits beside your throne, and let me be a child of yours. My mother was your servant, and so am I, a mere human whose life is short. I understand only a little about laws and judgments, because even a perfect human is really nothing without wisdom from you. You have chosen me to rule and judge your people, and here on your holy mountain, in the city where you live, you have commanded me to build an altar and a temple just like that sacred temple you made at the beginning. Wisdom has always been with you. She knows your mighty deeds, and she was there when you created the world. Wisdom knows what pleases you, and she knows what is right according to your commands. So from your glorious and holy throne in the heavens, please send wisdom to work beside me and teach me what is pleasing to you. Wisdom will guide me in all that I do, and her glory will guard me, because she knows everything. Then you will approve my actions, and I will rule your people with fairness, which will show that I am worthy to succeed my father as king. No one can know what you, the Lord God, demand of us humans. Our reasoning is faulty, and our schemes often fail, because our mortal bodies are merely earthly tents that burden down our souls and our anxious minds. We struggle and know so little about things here on earth. How could we possibly learn about things in heaven? Who has known your thoughts before you gave them wisdom and your Holy Spirit? Then they found the right path. They learned what pleased you and were saved by wisdom. Wisdom in the Time of Moses Solomon continues praying. Chapter 10 Wisdom protected Adam, the father of the human race. When he was alone on earth, she kept him from sin and gave him the power to rule everything. But Adam's son Cain was evil, and he rejected wisdom. Then, in his anger, he destroyed himself by killing his brother. When Cain's sin caused a flood, wisdom came to the rescue by guiding the good man Noah in that flimsy wooden boat. When nations were frustrated by their own evil plans, wisdom noticed that Abraham was a good man. So she gave him strength to obey God, though Abraham dearly loved his son Isaac. Wisdom rescued the good man Lot when the ungodly people of those five cities died in the flames. The evidence of their evil can still be seen. The smoke that keeps rising from the desert, those trees with fruit that never ripens, and the pillar of salt that stands as a witness to Lot's wife, who refused to believe. By rejecting wisdom, these people became blind to what was right, and so they left a permanent witness to their foolishness. But she protected those who were obedient to her. Wisdom guided that good man Jacob along the right paths when he was running from his angry brother. She showed him your kingdom and helped him understand sacred things. She also made him successful in everything he did. Wisdom even stood by him and made him rich when he was being mistreated by people who were jealous of him. She protected him from enemies who were waiting to attack, 
and when he wrestled with an angel, she let him learn that obeying you, our God, is what makes a person really powerful. When that good man Joseph was sold as a slave, wisdom kept him from committing a terrible sin. She even went down into the dungeon where he was a prisoner, and she stayed with him until he was given authority over those who had been in charge of him. Wisdom proved that his accusers were wrong and brought him honor that will last forever. Wisdom led Israel out of Egypt. Solomon continues praying. Wisdom rescued the holy and faultless nation of Israel from those who were oppressing them. She did this by entering the soul of your servant Moses and opposing cruel kings with her amazing miracles. Wisdom rewarded those holy people for their hardships and guided them in a wonderful way, providing shade for them during the day and starlight at night. She brought them safely through the Red Sea, but she drowned their enemies and washed their bodies up on the shore. So your obedient people took the possessions of those ungodly people. Then they sang praises to your holy name and praised you for protecting them, because wisdom healed those who could not talk and helped infants to speak clearly. Wisdom led Israel through the desert. Solomon continues praying. Chapter 11 Wisdom made the people of Israel successful by sending them the holy prophet Moses. They went through a desert where no one lived and camped in places where no one had ever been. They defeated their enemies, and when they were thirsty and prayed for your help, you made water flow from a solid rock. The Egyptians were punished. Solomon continues praying. Our Lord, your people were helped by the same disasters that were used to punish their enemies. You turned the ever-flowing Nile River into filthy blood to punish the Egyptians for ordering the Hebrew children to be killed. Then you surprised everyone by providing your people with more than enough water to satisfy their thirst. You mercifully let your people go thirsty for a while to show how severely you would punish their ungodly enemies in your anger. You corrected your people like parents correcting their children as a warning, but you punished the others like a harsh king condemning a criminal. All the Egyptians suffered, those who lived near your people and those who lived far away. In fact, they suffered at the time of these disasters and again whenever they remembered what had happened. And when the Egyptians learned that your people had benefited from these troubles, they realized that you, Lord, had done it all. Earlier they had made fun of Moses, who had been placed outside to die when he was a baby. But now they were amazed at him, because they suffered from thirst much more severely than your people. More Punishment for the Egyptians Solomon continues praying. The Egyptians were so foolish and evil that they worshipped mindless snakes and worthless animals, and so you sent swarms of senseless creatures to punish them and to teach them that sin brings its own punishment. With your own mighty arm you made the world out of something that had no form. And so you could have sent a lot of bears or ferocious lions. Or you could have created savage beasts just to punish them, beasts that breathe out fire and smoke and shoot sparks from their eyes, killing people not only by the injuries they cause, but by their very appearance. In fact, you could have wiped out the Egyptians with a single breath, while you were scattering them with your power and treating them as they deserved. But you do everything fairly and according to the laws of nature that you created. God is powerful and merciful. 
Solomon continues praying. You always have the strength to do what you want, and no one can oppose you. In your sight, the universe is merely a grain of sand that tips a balanced scale or a drop of dew in the early morning. You can do anything, and yet you patiently show mercy to everyone so that they will turn from their sins. In all creation, there is nothing you don't love. Otherwise, you would not have created everything. Nothing would have lasted unless you had wanted it to. Chapter 12 All living creatures belong to you, and you love them all because your eternal spirit is in each of them. That's why you correct us for our sins a little at a time, as a reminder and a warning for us to turn from sin and have faith in you, our Lord. The Sins of the People of Canaan Solomon continues praying. And what about those who lived in your holy land before your people settled there? You hated them because of their horrible deeds. They practiced magic and did vulgar things when they worshipped their gods. They mercilessly sacrificed children and ate human flesh and blood. They were members of pagan cults and murdered their own helpless children. That's why you decided to let our ancestors destroy them, so that your most precious land would accept a group of people worthy to be your servants. But since these people were merely human, you spared many of them and sent hornets ahead of your army to destroy them a little at a time. You did this even though you could have let your own people destroy that evil nation, or you could have wiped them out all at once with fierce animals or with one harsh word. Although you knew that they were sinful by nature and that they would never give up their evil thoughts, you still punished them little by little, giving them time to turn back to you. They were under your curse from the beginning, and though you were not afraid of anyone, you let them go unpunished. God rules all people. Solomon continues praying. All of us are merely human, and we cannot question what you have done, nor can we refuse to let you punish us. No one would dare to blame you for destroying those nations you created or dare to defend the guilty in your court of law. You alone are God, and you care for all creation. So you don't have to prove to any other gods that you do what is right, and no kings or rulers can accuse you of wrongly punishing anyone. You are always perfectly fair, and you would never punish innocent people. You do what is right because you have the strength to do so, and your great power makes you merciful to everyone. When anyone doubts your strength, you show how strong you are, and you correct anyone who understands and still doubts. Although you have power to do all things, you are gentle when you judge us, and you rule us with great patience. Lessons God Taught His People Solomon continues. Our God, by the things you have done, you have given your people a wonderful hope and have taught them to live right and be kind because you have let them turn from evil. The enemies of your people deserved death, but you patiently gave them time to give up their sins before punishing them. You did severely punish your people, even though you had made wonderful promises and agreements with them. Yes, we were punished. But our enemies were punished ten thousand times worse, so that when we judge others, we will remember your kindness. And when we are being judged, we can expect mercy. God punished the Egyptians. Solomon continues praying. The Egyptians foolishly lived a sinful life, but you punished them by using those disgusting creatures they worshipped. In fact, 
They had gone so far from the truth that they were like senseless children worshipping the most worthless animals. And so you made them look like stupid children when you punished them. Those who failed to take this warning seriously then received from you the punishment they deserved. While they were being punished because of the creatures they had worshipped, they became angry at those creatures and finally realized that you are the only true God, even though they had always refused to worship you. All this explains why they were punished so terribly. It is foolish to worship nature. Solomon continues praying. Chapter 13 You are the living God, and only those who are fools by birth could look at your creation and not learn about you. But instead, some people worship the things you created, such as fire and wind and storms and stars and rivers and planets. Those fools believed these things were the gods that ruled the world, because they were so beautiful. But you are the Lord, as well as the source of all beauty. So let those fools know how much more beautiful you are than any of these things. And if anyone is amazed at the mighty power of nature, then they should realize that the Creator is even more powerful. Indeed, the power and beauty of nature should convince us that their Creator is even more powerful and beautiful. On the other hand, these people are not entirely to blame for taking the wrong path in their desire to know and to find you. It is to be expected that while searching they would learn to trust the beautiful things they were seeing. However, this is no excuse, because if they possessed the ability to examine the universe, why did it take them so long to find you, the Lord of the universe? Idolatry is foolish. Solomon continues praying. Some people are miserable because they have set their hopes either on lifeless idols crafted in the shape of animals from gold and silver, or else on some old pieces of worthless stone. A woodcutter may saw down a small tree, then peel off the bark and skillfully make something worthwhile from the wood. Some of the leftover wood may be used for a cooking fire, while a crooked and knotty piece may be carefully carved into the shape of a human or of some useless animal before being painted red to cover all its flaws. A special shelf is made on the wall, and the idol is fastened to the shelf with metal nails to keep it from falling, because the one who made it realizes that it is merely a helpless idol. Then, without shame, its maker prays to this lifeless idol for help with finances, marriage, or family. Its maker asks for good health from something weak, for life from something dead, for guidance from something without experience, for a safe journey from something that cannot walk, and for wealth and success from something that cannot move its hands. Praying to an idol is foolish. Solomon continues praying. Chapter 14 Sailors preparing to travel across dangerous waters will pray for safety to a flimsy piece of wood, less sturdy than their ship. Shipmakers use their own wisdom to build a ship that will make them rich. But our father... You are the one who guides it safely through the sea to show that you alone can protect inexperienced travelers from danger. By your wisdom, you created the laws of nature. And so people trust even the smallest splinter of wood to bring them safely to land. When this world was still young, you sent a flood to destroy giants, while at the same time you gave hope for a generation of good people 
by letting their ancestors find safety in a boat made of wood that God had blessed. Idols are under your curse because those perishable things are called gods, and their makers are under your curse for having made them. In fact, you hate evil people as much as you hate the evil they produce, and you will equally punish evildoers together with their deeds. You will destroy those horrible pagan idols because they were made from part of your creation and have become a trap for foolish people. Idolatry and Evil Solomon continues praying. Our God, the idea of making an idol was itself the first step toward being unfaithful to you. Idols were not here in the beginning, and they won't be around forever. They resulted from human pride, and so you have plans for them to end quickly. For example, a father made an idol to look like his child, who had suddenly died, and the dead child then became an object of worship by later generations, who followed mysterious and secret ceremonies. Over the years, such godless ceremonies became customs and then laws, as rulers commanded idols of themselves to be carved and worshipped. And when people lived far from their rulers, they tried to make idols that looked like their rulers so that they could honor and flatter those rulers as if they were there with them. In fact, some people who did not know what their rulers looked like were led to worship them because of the skill and the tireless efforts of those who made beautiful idols to please their rulers. Finally, many people started worshipping their earthly rulers as gods. As a result, idolatry became a hidden trap for those who were suffering or were under the authority of rulers, and they called these idols gods, although you alone are God. Not only are such people ignorant about you, but this ignorance makes them terrible enemies of each other, even while they think they are living at peace. They kill their children as sacrifices and conduct secret ceremonies. They follow strange customs and act like wild people. They are immoral and cause great pain by being unfaithful in marriage. And they are deceitful murderers. Violence, murder, robbery, deceit, corruption, dishonesty, riots, and lying are everywhere. No one knows right from wrong, or shows gratitude, or cares about anyone else. All of them are sexual perverts, or share weird marriage unions, or are otherwise completely disgusting. The worship of worthless idols is the cause and result of all kinds of evil. Their worshippers act crazy, or give false messages in the name of God, or live sinful lives. They never speak the truth, and they tell lies in court, because they trust in these lifeless idols and don't expect to be punished. But they will be punished for worshipping idols instead of you, the holy God, and for disgracing you with their deceitful lies. Sinners don't receive help from the idols they worship, but the penalty for their sins follows them in hot pursuit. It pays to worship God. Solomon continues praying. Chapter 15 You, our God, are gentle and trustworthy, patiently ruling the universe with mercy. We know your mighty power, and so we remain your people, even if we sin. But knowing we are yours will keep us from sin. Nothing is more fitting than knowing you and realizing that your power is the way to endless life. We have not been misled by wicked artists who made bright-colored idols to encourage fools to worship those lifeless images. Those who make or worship idols as objects of hope will get what they deserve for loving such evil things. 
It is foolish to worship clay idols. Solomon continues praying. Potters form ordinary dishes and special dishes from the same lump of clay, and only the potters decide which ones will be ordinary or special. Then, wasting their energy, these potters form a useless idol from the same clay. And not long ago, these potters themselves were made from the soil and will soon turn back into soil, just like all other humans, when it is time to return our borrowed souls. But these potters don't care that we all must die or that life is short. They consider it a wonderful thing to mold false gods, and all they care about is competing with others who make idols out of gold or silver or copper. The heart of such workers is made of ashes. Their hope is worth no more than dirt, and their lives are of less value than clay, because they don't know you, the God who formed their bodies, then filled them with a lively soul and breathed into them a living spirit. They think of life as a meaningless game, or as a festival for making money, because they believe that we should try to get rich in every way possible, even by dishonesty. More than anyone else, these people realize that they are sinning when they make dishes and idols from the same clay. The Egyptians Solomon continues praying. Our God, those Egyptians who abused your people were the most foolish of all and were more pitiful than infants. This is because they believed that their pagan idols really were gods. Those images that could neither see nor breathe nor hear nor use their hands or feet. They were made by some human whose soul was borrowed and none of us can make a god that is our equal. In fact, we humans are mortal ourselves, and any idol we make with our own evil hands is less than we are, and is completely lifeless. Those Egyptians worshipped snakes, the lowest form of animal life, a form of life so ugly that you did not even give it your blessing. Chapter 16 You were right, to punish the Egyptians by sending snakes to attack those worshippers of snakes. But you did not punish your own people. Instead, you treated them with kindness and sent tasty quails for them to eat and enjoy. You did these things so that when those Egyptians were hungry, they would feel sick and lose their appetites because they would have to eat the horrible meat of snakes. However, after suffering for a while, your own people enjoyed the best of foods. In this way, those who had been oppressed could watch their oppressors suffer cruel punishment. When you were angry with your people and were destroying them with poisonous snakes, you stopped before all of them died because you did this merely as a warning. Then you told them to make a metal snake so that they would be rescued and remember to obey your law. Everyone who looked at the metal snake was saved, not because of the snake itself, but because of you, the Savior of all people. By doing this, you proved to our enemies that you alone can protect people from harm because many of them got what they deserved when they died from the bites of locusts and flies. But you were merciful to your children and healed them from poisonous snake bites so that they would remember your teachings and never forget your kindness. Medicine isn't what healed them. Only your word can heal, because you rule both life and death and possess the power to give life or to take it away. It's easy enough for us humans to kill another in anger. But we don't have the power to bring back a departed spirit or to set a soul free from the world of the dead. Egypt is struck by storms. 
Solomon continues praying. No one can escape from you, our God. And when those evil Egyptians rejected you and tried to escape, you punished them with your mighty arm and wiped them out with rainstorms, hailstones, and fiery lightning. Although water is used to put out a fire, an amazing thing happened. The water made the fire even more destructive because nature itself protects good people. One time you kept the fire under control so that it would not destroy the frogs and flies that were sent to punish those pagans and to let them know that you were the one doing all of this. But at another time you let it burn out of control, even in water, to wipe out the crops in that evil country. God provides manna for his people. Solomon continues praying. You blessed your people with manna, that food of angels, the bread you sent down from heaven. It satisfied their hunger and tasted delicious. Your care for your people was as sweet as this bread that everyone enjoyed so much. And though the bread was frail as snowflakes, it did not melt in the fiery flames that your enemies saw destroying their crops during the hailstorm. Contrary to nature, the fire did not spread to the crops of your people. All of creation serves you, its creator, and uses its power to punish those who are evil and to show kindness to those who trust in you. And so on that occasion, the forces of the universe changed the way they work in order to serve your purpose by answering the prayers of your precious children. This was also your way of teaching them not to depend upon their crops, but rather to depend upon your word, since it takes care of those who trust you. Even the manna that survived the fire then melted in the warmth of the sun. This shows that we must rise before dawn to pray to you, because if we are ungrateful, our hope will melt like frost and flow away like dirty water. The Egyptians are struck by terror. Solomon continues praying. Chapter 17 Your decisions are difficult to explain, and people who have not been taught have followed the wrong path. For example, those lawless Egyptians thought that your chosen people were under their power, but they themselves became prisoners in their very own homes for a long, dark night, because they were not under the protection of your eternal care. They thought that you had forgotten and that their secret sins were hidden behind a curtain of darkness when gruesome creatures seemed to appear. Nowhere in their homes were they safe from the fear of terrifying noises and the frightening faces of gloomy ghosts. On that miserable night, the darkness was so thick that neither flaming lamps nor bright stars could be seen and when lightning flashed, the fearsome sight was worse than the darkness. The Egyptians had depended on their magical powers and had boasted about their great wisdom, but all of this proved useless. There were some who said they could cure the fears and worries of sick minds, but they themselves became sick with foolish fear. Even if nothing else frightened them, they were terrified by the sounds of wild animals outside and by hissing snakes. They were so frightened that they refused to open their eyes. But keeping them closed did not relieve their fears, because evil people are cowards condemned by their own consciences, and whatever they fear becomes even more frightening. Fear takes over when people stop reasoning. They no longer think straight, and their only hope is to deny the real source of their problems. 
night itself is powerless, since it comes from the powerless world of the dead. And yet the Egyptians slept restlessly on that night, because of the horrible and unexpected nightmares brought on by the surrender of their souls to the forces of evil. Every one of the Egyptians, including farmers and shepherds, fell prisoner to the fear of a darkness that was more difficult to escape than iron chains. The slightest noise made them paralyzed with fear. The songs of birds in the trees, the rhythm of rushing water, the surprising crash of a rock, the hoofbeats of animals jumping about, the roar of lions, or even an echo in the mountains. Everywhere else in the world, everyone went about their own business in broad daylight, while these Egyptians were covered with a heavy blanket of darkness, like the darkness of death, that would soon capture them. But the trouble they brought upon themselves was an even heavier burden than the darkness. God sends light to guide his people. Solomon continues praying. Chapter 18 A bright light was shining on your chosen people, and although the Egyptians could not see your people, they could hear them and considered them lucky because they were not suffering. The Egyptians were thankful that the people they had abused were not abusing them in return, and so they begged your chosen people for forgiveness. Then, with a flaming fire at night, and with the warmth of the sun during the day, you guided your people through places they had never traveled before. Their enemies deserved to be prisoners of absolute darkness because they had imprisoned your children who would bring the light of your law to the world. Death of the Firstborn Sons of the Egyptians Solomon continues praying. The Egyptians wanted to kill the newborn sons of your chosen people, but Moses was rescued and survived. Then you decided to punish the Egyptians by killing their firstborn sons and by drowning their army in the sea. However, the night before our ancestors left Egypt, you warned them of what would happen. So they were able to celebrate, knowing that you would keep your promise to rescue your obedient people and to destroy their enemies just as they knew you would. By these same events, you punished your enemies and rewarded us, your chosen people. At this time also, the wonderful ancestors of our holy nation secretly offered sacrifices to you, and all of them agreed to obey your law, so that together they would share in the same blessings and dangers. Already they were singing hymns of praise to you, while their enemies cried bitter tears and made mournful sounds over the death of their children. Every family suffered the same punishment, whether they were slaves or slave owners, ordinary people or royalty. In one brief moment, the dearest child in each family died, leaving not even enough people to bury the dead. The Egyptians had been deceived by displays of magic. However, after the death of their firstborn sons, they realized that we were the children of God. In the middle of the night, when all was peaceful and quiet, your mighty word came down from your royal throne in heaven to attack a doomed land. Your word was like a fierce warrior carrying a sharp sword and ready to obey your every command by killing people everywhere. When he stood on the earth, his head touched the sky. Many of the Egyptians died a dreadful death that night, but not before nightmares and terrifying dreams showed them why they were being punished. God's People in the Desert Solomon continues praying. 
For a while you were angry with your people in the desert and killed many of them with a terrible disease. Then a good man by the name of Aaron came to their rescue by using prayer and incense as a shield to protect your people from punishment for their sins, because he was a priest. So he stood up against your anger and ended the disaster. He did not convince the crowd and end their suffering by his own strength or by weapons. He did it by reminding them of the wonderful agreements you had made with our ancestors. Piles of dead bodies were everywhere when Aaron succeeded in turning away your anger and in keeping others from being struck down, and his long robe symbolized the entire universe while the four rows of precious stones on his breastpiece stood for our glorious ancestors, and his turban represented you, our majestic God. At the sight of these, the death angel retreated in fear. A little of your anger was enough. The Egyptians drown in the Red Sea. Solomon continues praying. Chapter 19 You remained angry with those worthless Egyptians and kept punishing them without mercy, because you already knew how they would change their minds and chase your people after hurriedly setting them free. As a matter of fact, they made this foolish decision even before they had finished mourning for their dead. Then they started pursuing those very people they had begged and even forced to leave. They were urged on by the destruction they deserved, and it made them forget what had already happened, so that they would be fully punished by dying an unusual death, and so that your people would have an amazing journey. God protects his people and punishes the Egyptians. Solomon continues praying. At your command, the laws of nature were changed to protect your children from harm. A cloud guided them, and dry land appeared like a field of grass in the middle of the Red Sea, so that your people could see wonderful miracles and pass safely through under your protection. They were like horses on an open range, or like lambs leaping around as they praised you for saving them. And they still remembered what had happened in Egypt. The land was covered with gnats instead of animals, and the rivers were filled with frogs instead of fish. Later, when they were starving in the desert and begged for something delicious to eat, you provided them with a special kind of bird by sending quails from the direction of the Mediterranean Sea. Those sinful Egyptians had a terrible hatred for strangers, and so you punished them horribly, but not without first warning them with violent thunderstorms. Years earlier, the people of Sodom had refused to welcome strangers, and they were punished for what they did. But these Egyptians did much worse. They first welcomed our ancestors with a glorious celebration, and then, after we had helped their nation, they made slaves of us, even though we were citizens like everyone else. Those people of Sodom were struck blind just as they reached the door of the home of that good man Lot, and they had to feel their way back through the darkness to their own homes. In the same way, these Egyptians were covered with deep darkness. Harmony of the Universe Solomon continues praying. Different tunes can be played on the same harp, though the strings remain the same. And this is similar to what happened in those days, as can be seen from the following examples. Land animals became sea creatures, and sea creatures became land animals. Fire kept burning even when it was covered with water, and yet its flames did not destroy the flesh of humans 
or melt that delicate and dainty food called manna that came down from heaven. Our Lord, you have always greatly honored your people. You have never failed to help them at any time or in any place. This ends Wisdom of Solomon, narrated by John McDonough. This ends Disc 1.